through to the agenda as follows. Uh, we have no apologies. Uh, um, okay. And uh, declaration of uh, members' interest and can I remind members that they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest before and during each committee meeting. And uh, I'm assuming no. Well, Chair, maybe I should declare that. I think I have two live complaints with the Ombudsman's Office. Thank you, Mr. Alistair. Any others? No? Okay. Um, we'll move now to uh, the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of September uh, 2020, which are uh, at pages 6 to 10 of the meeting pack. Uh, can I ask uh, mem if members are content uh, with the minutes? Yes? Yes. Chair, can I just ask? You'll forgive me because I haven't sat on okay. uh, formal committees, but uh, just the police and board. So can I just ask, should the fact that we agreed to table a motion not be included in the minutes, or is that extraneous? Is this in, in referring to the last committee meeting? Yeah. Yeah. It's what it should be. Should. Chair, I think there, there is reference to the motion in the minutes. Okay. <sighs> okay, John. You can tend to the well, Does it actually mention a motion? Because I know it said we're going to investigate options, but is it? Could somebody. Yep. Page 8 of the. Just to get myself okay. sorted out here. Yeah, page 8 under item. Which part do I are you not content with? Well, just, uh, uh, off the top of my head, I obviously I can't say yeah. it just yet. So could somebody just? I, I don't recall actually saying it's specifying that we had agreed to table the motion. Well, it says that the committee agreed, arising from its earlier deliberations and the comparative research, it will consider the option of a committee motion to alert the assembly to potential gaps in the governance and accountability arrangements for TA, TNAG, and NIPSA. So we're content that we agreed to consider it, as opposed to agreed to do it. Is there any members any thoughts on that? Well, I think, Chair, on the private business, we're obviously going to return to that issue. Yes. So maybe if we yeah. park it for the moment. Uh, would, Joanne, would you be content with yes, return to that? Yes, that's okay. no problem. That's correct. Okay. Thank so. you. Uh, if members are content, uh, uh, as agreed, we'll uh, proceed. Um, matters arising. Can I inform members uh, that an update from the Department of Finance has been received in relation to the timetable for agreeing the executive's budget, which has changed due to the delay in the outcome of the spending review? Uh, and can I ask uh, the clerk to outline uh, the update to our members? Thank you, clerk. Thanks. And the committee previously agreed a scrutiny timetable, which would enable this committee to reach possession in relation to the draft budgets for the three um, non-ministerial public bodies, um, and publish a report in line with the executive's budget process. And um, this had been anticipated and has been required by the end of October. Therefore, evidence sessions had been scheduled from the three minister non-ministerial bodies in time for that. Um, as the chair alluded to, the timetable was dependent on the outcome of the UK government spending review. The finance minister updated the House uh, yesterday in relation to that, and we know that that review has been delayed. Uh, we understand subsequently from officials that the spending review may not take place until early to mid November. Comments have been sought, however, from PAC in the case of the Audit Office draft budget and from the Department of Finance in relation to all three bodies. In the interim, a comment is uh, required in order for this committee to make a decision. Okay. Uh, so you want that now? Yep. Uh, members, that. Uh, Whilst the committee can continue to take evidence on the draft budget 2021-2022, substantial comments from the Department of Finance in relation to this 
may not be received until after the outcome of the spending review is known. The committee is required under agreed protocols to consider this comment in order to agree its position. So can I ask uh, the members to consider if evidence sessions scheduled for the 21st of October uh, should still proceed given this delay? Remind us who we were seeing on the 21st. Yeah. The same people as today? Yeah. This is the initial evidence session today, so subsequent briefings after that, the committee could consider both sessions and the decision. Is it normal to have two sessions? Uh, that's what's happened in the past. It allows some time for the, the comment to be received from the Public Accounts Committee in respect of the Audit Office and from the Finance and Relations Office. Therefore, the, it's just to to give that space for the comment to be received. Yes. To, to go ahead or to, to pause until we hear from the yeah. Well, uh, 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 basically, are you happy to proceed given the delay? And we well, if we don't proceed, we're going to be telescoped into a very short period of time, I would have thought. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. All content? Okay. Uh, can I remind members that at the last meeting... Out of one query, um, this committee clashes very substantially with my finance committee, which is also doing important business on the 21st. Are we tied to the 21st? Um, There's stuff in the papers about changing the time. Yeah. About, about moving, the, moving the... How does that date affect other, mem uh, other members? I'm, I'm, okay. I'm flexible within the Wednesday, but it's we start to change the day of it. It would create problems for me, yeah, but yeah. certainly the time, and I'm flexible on. 21st, yeah. isn't it? Mm. We've explored the... Just to know, for example, the finance minister's appearing before the finance committee on the 21st. Uh -huh. I'm interested. Um, yeah. I'm okay to come in earlier. Yeah, what's the earliest we could do it? Uh, yeah. So the committee time, yeah, but the committee time has been agreed uh, of one, uh, and the finance committee meets at two. But no, that's the clash uh, that exists. Yeah. But we could you, seek you, to. You talked about noon, Claudia. Yeah, or twelve fifteen, if possible. Yeah. But we, now the, the difficulty we have is obviously, <coughs> Chair, I have another clash as well earlier, um, so mm. it, it, it is causing. A bit of an issue. I, I, I could seek to accommodate twelve thirty. Would that be a compromise? That yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. Everyone else okay? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, okay, yeah. uh, can I remind uh, members that at the, at the last meeting of the committee on the sixteenth of September, the committee agreed to commission research on the variance figures and thresholds in relation to environment. Uh, that apply in relation to comparator bodies. This research was requested to inform a committee decision in relation to agreeing a budget threshold of over or, or underspend between the Assembly Commission and the committee. It is anticipated that this paper will be provided for the next committee meeting. Can I inform? Uh, we've already discussed uh, in relation to that time, so if members are happy to proceed, uh, 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 we're all agreed in relation uh, to that. So if members uh, are uh, in agreement, can we move to closed session for the next item of business? If anyone else. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I remind uh, members that the session is being recorded by Hansard and refer members to the revised briefing paper from Commission officials at pages 21 to 26 of your tabled packs. The NIAC budget 2020-2021 uh, information in relation to capital expenditure has been revised with more detail since meeting since the meeting pack was issued. Uh, can I welcome um, when they enter the room the following witnesses? Are they outside? Okay. Thanks. Think somebody went for them. So we have question up first.
Thank you. Can uh, I welcome the Chief Executive of the Assembly, Leslie Hogg, and also the Director of Corporate Services, uh, Richard Stewart. You're most welcome to the committee. Uh, can I ask uh, witnesses to make a, a short opening statement? And we, we have a lot on today, so you keep it as brief uh, uh, and as to the point as possible, and then we'll go straight to questions, if that's okay with you both. Thank you, Chair, and yes, I'm happy to keep it very brief. Um, I think, Chair, the best way to begin is by noting that the Assembly Commission sees the budget for 21-22 really as a restart. The Commission's underlying role of providing the services required to the Assembly has continued unabated during this year, even if it has happened in a slightly different manner from before. But it is hoped that next year we'll see the restart of many of the plans that were in place for 2021, such as the restart of outreach and engagement activities that were planned and a restart of the investments that were planned. As a result, the Commission's proposed budget for 21-22 is also something of a restart. For that reason, the budget pre presented for 21-22 is largely the same as the original budget for 2021. Naturally, it has been amended by the expenditure that could arise from the determination published by the Commission in August of this year, and that was discussed when we met with the Committee in September. But apart from that, it seeks a running cost budget that mirrors the amounts for 2021. Chair, I think there are just a few issues that I think are important to bring to the Committee's attention in respect of next year's budget. Firstly, the timetable for preparing the Commission's budget means that it is possible that changes will, be ma will need to be made based on the prevailing circumstances between now and the consideration of the overall budget for the Northern Ireland block grant by the Assembly in around January or shortly thereafter. To that end, the Commission will review the figures presented today over the next six to eight weeks and there is likely to be, um, there's unlikely to be any significant change, but if there is, then we'll report those back to the committee. Secondly, the budget for next year is based on an underlying assumption that the operating environment will have returned to more or less normal environment by next year. If that's not the case, then it seems likely once again that changes to the budget will be required. As far as the budget numbers are concerned, the requirement for resource Dell is now £49.037 million. In the briefing of March this year, I went over the expenditure categories in the budget in detail. The budget is largely unaltered for next year, apart from the addition of £4.235 million for the cost that could arise from the 2020 determination and a small technical change to remove notional costs from the figures and the split is set out in Annex A. The planned investment in Capital Dell is £1.385 million, and that is set out in Appendix B. Chair, it's not that long ago that we considered the Commission's budget for 2021, and we have also recently looked at the impact of the 2020 determination. As I mentioned in my introductory remarks, this is really a restart budget for 21-22 that largely takes the figures for this financial year and applies them to next financial year. The Chair, Members, thank you once again for the opportunity to present the Commission's budget proposals for 21-22, and Richard and I are happy to answer any questions that the Committee may have. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Leslie and Richard, again, for being here, uh, and thank you for uh, keeping your comments brief. We, we, we appreciate that, uh, and also for outlining uh, the various uh, challenges, I suppose, that lie ahead. Obviously, uh, as noted last week, in my absence, the determination will have its impact on the budget, and we are very conscious of that. I know other members will have comments to make. I have no specific questions at this point, but I will come in at a later time. Uh, I'll open it to other members who may wish to ask any specific questions. Chairman, if I may, just a, a couple of things. Um, Leslie, could you maybe outline for us um, if a million pounds sure. set aside for capital pressures, could you maybe give us some indication of that? Um, advice us about the uh, upgrades to the security systems. Uh, and I'd be keen to understand, you'll forgive me, I'm not clear what a UAG is. 
um, and also the uh, audio system for the assembly chamber valued at half a million pounds. Translation system, if you could clarify that for me. And lastly, um, with regard to just a, a current staffing issue, uh, is there any consideration being given in terms of budgets and value for money to the interim redeployment of front-facing staff uh, in the Assembly at present, bearing in mind that the building is closed to the public and yet committee staff are facing a backlog of a number of months as a result of lockdown, uh, maybe redeploying those staff would assist committee staff in helping committees to uh, redeem some, some of their lost time. That's me done, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, whenever we refer to it as a pressure, it's really just because there's no occurring capital there. So anything we want in terms of capital expenditure has to be put forward for each year. So it's not that there's an additional pressure. The total is set out in Annex B, and this year our indicative capital budget is £1.385 million. Pounds. So you mentioned um, the replacement of the security management system, and that's really the likes of our cameras and the underlying software for the building. We had hoped to progress that further in the current year, so that would have been in our budget for last year, but just because of the assembly um, getting back up and running again, and then with COVID, that project has been delayed. So it's really just the replacement of the infrastructure and the software for the security of the building. I think then you mentioned the UAG, was that the, um, and that's just in terms of connecting um, into the assembly systems remotely. So when you're out of the building, etc., you're connecting through your tablet. That's just the. Um, what does it stand this, for, please, Leslie? Pardon? What does it stand for, please? I have no idea what UAG stands for, but it's it's what our IS office call it. It's the UAG. But as okay. Leslie said, it is it is simply mechanism that allows us to access um, all our files, all yeah. our storage within the building uh, that's held on our servers, on your tablets, typically. Well, that, that's a great thing. I'm glad I'm not the only one who didn't know them. <laughs> There's lots of technical terms. Yes. Um, you mentioned also the audio system in the chamber. Um, the audio system in the chamber is extremely old. Mm -hmm. um, as is, and I think as we, when we were here in March, we talked about this as well, that a lot of our broadcasting infrastructure is in need of replacement. So, again, because of the, the timing, um, rather than wait and do everything in a big bang, potentially, you know, at the end of the mandate, we would like to try and progress some of this on a staged basis. So our plan is that we would like to try and upgrade the audio element next summer, during the summer recess and then we would look at the cameras and so on the following year. So at this stage, this is a very, very indicative figure. Um, that project is really only in the very early stages and therefore we, we don't have a refinement for the figure at this stage until we go through the project and look at the procurement options, et cetera, and the best way to implement that. You also then mentioned about um, the frontline staff. So. Most of the available um, frontline staff have already been redeployed to support other business areas because obviously there are pressures. Um, so that has already taken place. And again, if there are any vacant posts, you know, they obviously wouldn't have been filled at this point. Most, not all, have been redeployed. Well, there's still some work going on. So, I mean, not all of the frontline staff are only public facing. You know, they do deal with other matters in the background, so there's still some ongoing work there, albeit fairly minimal. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I just supplement a, a point that John I know, Leslie, you've touched on the audio systems within the actual assembly chamber, uh, and uh, I welcome the uh, update in relation to that. Uh, I'm just wondering, I've noticed that Westminster uh, and indeed other uh, chambers that uh, the elected members can remotely speak via teleconference and call Starleaf, if you like. Is it, has there been any consideration given uh, to that for the Assembly? Have the Commission raised that directly with yourself, that mechanism? Because, for instance, I'm speaking from experience, I was at home for two weeks, could have been engaging in the Assembly in that situation. And as this uh, COVID crisis continues and we're seeing more and more people go into isolation, uh, uh, I think it's important that we try and keep Assembly business functioning uh, as normal as possible. So that 
that engagement from your own home into the chamber as is happening in Westminster. Has there been any consideration for that? Well, that would really be a matter for the Committee on Procedures and would require changes to standing orders. So obviously, if such changes were envisaged and brought forward, then we would obviously implement whatever solution was required to facilitate that. Okay. But at the, the minute, we haven't been requested no, to look at that. that, that that's uh, interesting as well. And ju just another point. Um, I know that for some time, and we've discussed this at previous meetings as well, the uh, upgrades for the, uh, the the TV screens around the building and the telephone system in the building, hugely out of date. I think they predate me, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is uh, uh, not not great. <laughs> uh, is there, has, where are we with those plans? I, I understood that those things would have happened over the course of the summer, uh, but uh, that hasn't happened as of yet. Well, the telephone system, that project is well underway and we're actually piloting it at the minute during October, so that project will be completed in the next couple of months. The, telepho or the um, television screen replacement, that really has been deferred into next year because obviously you'll understand in terms of changing so many working practices and getting the technology set up for remote working and so on during the COVID that really took a lot of time from our IS department and therefore the, the TV replacement has been pushed into next year. But you're quite right, they're long overdue. Uh -huh. And I think as we explained before, yeah. um, from a prudent point of view, the Commission didn't want to proceed while the Assembly wasn't meeting with the upgrade of the TV screens. Okay, thanks very much. And, and there's there's other uh, adaptions, adaptations to the building itself for disabled access, uh, I think from previous conversations as well at this committee. Uh, that were included in the budget for this year, I think. Um, where what, What's the situation with those? I know changing the Assembly Chamber to make it much more uh, disabled-friendly to uh, equip the needs of those who may require them. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's some... Um, you'll see in the, the current capital budget, there's £50,000 in, and that's to do with evacuation. Um, so we did have that in last year. And again, that project has been deferred into next year, and that's really looking at emergency evacuation and some work that might need to be done under lifts to facilitate that. In terms of the Assembly Chamber itself, nothing further has been planned at the minute. Um, obviously, certain parts of the Chamber are accessible, but at the point if we were doing any bigger upgrade in terms of equipment, um, that would be the time to look at that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, a couple of points. Um, in terms of the capital spend, is there any money set aside for roof repairs? Not specifically. I mean, we do have an ongoing cycle of repair and maintenance, um, and we're not aware of any significant repairs that require to be done at the minute. I must say. Unless you're familiar. Well, yes, I was on the That's third right. floor yesterday. Bucket. And I noticed areas where there's obvious water ingress. Mm -hmm. now, it's only a few years since we had the roof done. What's the problem? Well, there have been a few ongoing defects um, following the work that was done on the roof, and we're continuing to work through those with the contractor. Is there legal proceedings? No, <clears throat> there hasn't got the stage of legal proceedings. But if you are. look, you can notice where the various railings are that where they've been for some reason drilled into the parapet or whatever you call that mm -hmm. that, that then is cracking corresponding to where each stanchion is now, i'm no engineer but it struck me as an odd way inviting water ingress to establish that rail is that what's causing the water to come down I'll take that one, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that would be the biggest issue uh, that we're in discussions with both the designers and the contractor about. But that's a massive issue. There's hundreds of those stunts. Uh, well, I wouldn't go as far as hundreds, but it's, it's certainly at the, the back of the building. Uh, yeah. It would be the place where it would be um, the, the most pronounced. And in places then that's actually showing through the ceiling with water staining. Is that right? Yeah, I think at the back of the building there's there's a secondary issue not related to the roof project um, to do with the, the lift void, which is just, just outside the, the, the door here. And when it gets to the fourth floor, then there's, there's an issue with that. That's not connected to the, to the roof project. 
But yes, those railings would be the issue that we're uh, in so discussions who's, with the contractor who's responsible with. responsible for the botching of the railings? Um, well, I think the Commission would say that that would be a matter for the designer or the contractor. Uh, we paid for a, a proper job and we would take the view that that needs to be fixed. Well, you think it, how many years is it now? Four or five? Yeah, 14, 15, yeah. Well, has it gone to arbitration? Is there any proceedings issued? Are we bringing it to a head? No, th th we haven't got to that point of proceedings or arbitration. Um, it's through discussions with the designer and the contractor. And if it ends up that we have to pick up the tab, is that provided for in any of these budget? Well, I think before we got to the point of picking up the tab, we, we might well enter into uh, litigation. Oh. Mm -hmm. like it, does, it struck me that it has the potential to be a, a big issue. Yeah, it's, it's certainly an issue we, we would like the designer or the contractor to resolve. <laughs> Um, the one and a quarter million for the audio and camera that Joanne asked about, um, she asked, is that anything to do with provision of translation services? What's the clear answer to that? No, um, and there was an updated table sent through, so there's half a million pounds in the updated table. There's nothing in there for translation systems, so... <coughs> Again, until such times as the committee and procedures and the assembly was to change standing orders, um, yeah. we don't really know what the scope of services would, would be required. But at the point that's determined, we will obviously again seek the appropriate funding to implement that. And how, if that happened mid-year, how would you do that? Well, I think you know that's likely to be a very significant project and even if it was agreed mid-year um, it's unlikely we'd be able to complete much capital works I would have thought in the first year by the time the project was scoped to go through a procurement exercise we'd obviously have to do recruitment for staff as well so I mean that would be quite a big project. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Al? Uh, just a very small point, um, the security uh, hut on the way out of the building um, the staff have to come out to manually press a button outside to let you out. And no security issues really involved in letting people out. Um, would it be possible to uh, substitute some sort of a remote control from within their, their building? That, that, could be, that could be done without them having to come out in inclement weather and press a button. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's been considered at all. Um, it has been certainly has been talked about over the years, um, but it hasn't been implemented. Uh, we could certainly look at it, um, but it's it's maybe a what might be the value for money for that? Uh, mm -hmm. Just in this uh, this age of everything been remote, it seems yeah. a bit a bit manual that they have to come mm -hmm. out in the in the rain and inclement weather to do it. So maybe we would have a look at yeah. it. Yeah, chairman, there's another barrier at the other side where you drive up and the barrier lifts. It opens. Yeah, yeah uh, mm -hmm. there is. And that one is maybe a, a solid retail. There, it, it's meant to open, and it does open when it works. Um, but that technology, even though it's been around for years, um, you know, there would be an engineer out, you know, relatively frequently to fix that. And obviously, the, the control room can operate the barrier when there's nobody yeah. at the security facility. But I mean, we can certainly look at what would be required to automate it from the security facility. Just in, in terms of security, a very slight point, uh, not budgetary, uh, well not anything major anyway. Uh, prior to the collapse of the institutions, uh, we had uh, identity stickers on our car that recognised members so that we just get in. Now they're security nearly in the window on top of me trying to see who I am. Uh, it's not good for them, it's not helpful for them, it's not helpful for us. Uh, is there any way of reinstating something that clearly identifies members so we can just get into the built into the... I mean, the stickers actually, we, we moved away from that method simply because sometimes then we found that other people were perhaps using members' stickers. Um, I don't know whether it was members' cars or else members maybe were in other vehicles that didn't have the stickers, so now members are really... Um, allowed in on the basis of sight rather than sticker. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's just that the, it's not a major issue, but I just know it's 
So that was why we found other people were using yeah. members' stickers to, yeah. to get their cars into the building. Um, yeah. Can I just get um, a bit more information? Electronic access control department buildings, is that for staff or just elaborate on that a wee bit? Yes, this would be in terms of, I mean, you'll be aware there's no real security around the building in terms of electronic access going through internal doors in the building. Um, and this has been a matter that has been considered over a number of years as to whether there should be some automation of doors, etc., to restrict certain parts of the building to the public and keep certain parts then to members and staff and um, badge holders. So this would be a partial electronic access control system which would effectively allow a public area that the public, you know, around the Great Hall, etc., but then the rest of the building would be closed off and you would need, you know, some sort of pass to get through that. I mean, we have over the last couple of years tried to increase visitors to the building. We've got the members' dining room, we've got the portraits on the first floor, etc. And a few years ago, we did automate a lot of the doors from a disability access. And that's been very good from a disability access point of view. But the doors then are very inviting. So, for example, if you were to come out of Speaker's Corner shop, then the doors down to the Deputy First Minister's offices just automatically open in front of you. So then you find sometimes members of the public come out of the shop, the doors open, and they walk around the corridor. So at times we do find members of the public, you know, roaming round, or again, if they come to the back of the Great Hall, the doors open. And therefore, at the minute, we're purely reliant on the ushers to try and keep track of, you know, visitors in the building, and that's very difficult. So therefore, the, the idea would be that we would restrict public access and to get through certain doors, such as the back corridor and some of these corridors, and even upstairs through the lifts, you would need a pass to do that. Okay. Members content? I have no further questions, Leslie, and Richard, thank you very much um, okay. for uh, coming before us today and for uh, sharing the part of information with us. Keep up your good work, and also thank the staff of the Assembly for the huge amount of work that they do in supporting each of us and the role that we have uh, to play here. Um, it's not uh, easy times. I know there's a lot of anxiety about the spread of this infection, so I just uh, want to put firmly on record our thanks to you and to your team in the Assembly for the great work that you do. Thank you, and that's much appreciated. And can I ask broadcasting to uh, bring any witnesses using Starleaf into the spotlight? Um, sure, we don't have any witnesses. We don't have any for the next one. Oh, right, sorry, that's okay. Sorry, I thought it was this one, it's just there's someone, someone in the back there. I can't make it Who is that? The next station. Ah, right. <laughs> Early. <laughs> Keen. Yes. Uh, can I refer members uh, to the briefing paper from the NAO? Uh, Officials at 7.2 pages 29 to 37, members' table packs. Uh, at table 1 of the briefing paper and main pack, uh, it was updated uh, subsequent to this issue. And can I uh, also thank our guests uh, today for attending who represent the next uh, episode uh, Pamela McCready, Chief Operating Officer of the Northern Nod Office, and Rodney Allen, Director of Corporate Services of the Northern Nod Office. You're both very welcome again. Thank you very much for okay. attending. Okay. Uh, can I ask you to uh, make a short opening statement, uh, and uh, then we'll the members. Thank you very much, and you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. And it's good to see you're keeping well and, and back with us. Uh, hello to new members who I haven't met yet, so um, just send hello to everyone. Um, we welcome the opportunity to meet with you here today, um, particularly with regards to the three-year budget approach. Um, Longer-term planning is something, as an audit office, we've been advocating for a long time, and that's just as relevant to us in our organisation, especially in the development of our business transformation programme at the office as well. 
suppose to contextualise the budget going forward, I thought I would just spend a quick moment in reflection over the past three years. Um, and we have applied that strategic planning approach to improve and deliver our work. Some of the things have been around developing a three-year public reporting programme, um, really with the aim of being open, transparent, um, being agile and keeping the office relevant in what it reviews. Um, a focus on staff, uh, aligning skills, cost and efficiency. Um, as is, you'll see in the document, approximately 40 staff um, have left the organisation over that period uh, with the facilitation of VES, including senior roles. And we have been recruiting into graduate trainees, higher level apprentice and new expertise into the office around analytics, learning development, communications and HR. Over the, that period, we've had a strong focus on quality and governance. Uh, new advisory board has been appointed, uh, audit risk and assurance committee, and a new re remuneration committee. We've enhanced our quality review mechanisms in that period. So in addition to internal audit, external audit, and indeed the independent panel who reviews our reports, we've recently gone to market for independent quality assurance, and that's been appointed to ICAEW uh, from England. And last year we published new VFM standards, really outlining the standards and how we conduct our public reporting. We've been investing and developing uh, strongly in data analytics, um, and at this stage it's still in that research and development phase, but we see that being integral into modernising our audit practice going forward. And we've had a large focus on our people over that time, so quite a bit of structural change, obviously, over that period. We have a new people strategy. Um, we undertook a roles profile for all uh, roles throughout the organisation, and hence we've invested heavily into leadership and team effectiveness and recognising that a lot of change was going on in the office, have had strong engagement with our trade union colleagues um, who have positively engaged with us, challenged us, uh, and indeed support us. And I want to thank them for that. Um, I'm extremely proud of staff over that period of time and indeed in recent months. Um, they've been very committed to the organisation and very flexible in how they've worked over the past number of months. And finally, our other major project, which I'm sure we'll come on to at some point today, is around our accommodation project. Uh, being one of the key drivers in our strategic objectives for the organisation to, tr to transform our business and meet uh, emerging challenges. Um, and I'm sure we'll touch on that as well. We have achieved a lot. Um, there are a number of elements uh, of these changes that have an impact on our future funding. And that's laid out in our paper, so I'll not labour that anymore. I'm sure we'll come on to that in Q&A. So that's everything from me, Chair. Thank you very much. And thank you again for attending and uh, being before us. Uh, just two questions. Uh, one, uh, what do you foresee as challenges to your current budget at present um, and, uh, and this, in this year? And also, the, in terms of the accommodation project, are you still on budget or uh, have those costs changed? Yeah, okay. I'll take the challenges and I'll handle my learned colleague on the accommodation project as he's the SRO, so we might as well be fully accountable uh, in that regard. Um, we've outlined in the paper, and that's why I think it is important to reflect back. We're in a period um, where we're renewing our corporate plan, so that will be coming through to you as well. Um, and a lot of the initiatives and projects that we've started over the, the past couple of years um, have given us that strong baseline to go forward now. So um, really it's that continuing investment in people um, and adding into those skills. So one of those cost pressures going forward is the continued uh, recruitment of graduate trainees and higher level apprentices into the organisation. And I think we touched on it at our last meeting that for us to, I mean, 70% of what we do is around financial audit uh, and predominantly the rest is on public recording. We have other aspects of our work, but predominantly that's it. Um, and we've been over the past sort of 18 months, we've been bringing people through from those people that are involved in financial audit into the public reporting. So been maybe a little bit slower, but I think it's been the right thing to do around getting the right skill and expertise into the work. So there's a pressure as we continue to increase those numbers, there's a financial impact on that uh, going forward. Um, we've, uh, we've a number of challenges in there, particularly around um, income. Um, and again, we've clarified one of the major um, impacts on income was around our um, EAF, which is the Agricultural European Funds. But we've got eyes on that now through to about 22, 23. So it's, it's a bit more certain. Um, it's not forever there, but at least we've a little bit of certainty on it uh, going forward. So those, I mean, financially, um, we've, a little, we've included a little bit into the budget, as you will see, particularly on the public reporting side to support us taking forward some of the RHI recommendations and following up on the progress of that. 
For me, that's about enhancing our capacity in public reporting, and in doing that, we'll be able to incorporate uh, the work that we need to do on RHI into that. Um, so th there's a number of key pressures as we go forward, that, hence why we are, have been protecting our baseline. We've been, um, I think Rodney referenced before, that it feels like a recruitment agency in the audit office over the past 18 months, but there's a recurrent tail on that. So to date, we haven't felt the full year effect of that, um, but into next year and the following years, uh, we will. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Chairman, maybe before I answer your question, just very quickly, a bit of context, um, just, just for members, as I had talked about the committee before. So the background in the accommodation project, really, we, we, we're in a building in 106 University Street. Some members may have been in it. Um, the building effectively outgrew us. Um, we, we got too, too small for the building. We used to have bigger staff numbers. And the building, we've been in there for nearly 30 years. Um, I think I've on record as saying, you know, my office feels like a suite. It's that big. So it's of a certain time and an era. Um, and it's not most efficient use of, of, of accommodation and space at, at the moment. So we've been working with experts from Strategic Investment Board, from um, Construction and Procurement Delivery and DOF, um, to give us the relevant skill sets to guide us through this project. Um, I suppose I could simplistically say we're on budget, but that'd be very disingenuous. When I look back at Hansard from February and, and March to see what sort of numbers we talked about at that point in time, we were talking to this committee of a cost envelope just over four million um, plus. Um, you'll see from the papers in front of you today that that, that has only gone one direction, um, and we're now coming to you talking about a scheme that's in, uh, at six million pounds. So what are the reasons for that? Um, at that stage, back eight, nine months ago, we were very much at concept design. So we've walked through our IBA stage three, um, which is a very detailed design process to really come up with what is the right, you can all of that expert advice into account, what is the right design that we need for this project. So that resulted in increased costs. Um, that also flushed out some, some aspects of the building that we didn't expect to have to do in this project, such as windows. Um, and replacing windows across the whole building after nearly 30 years of their life. So that was a, a fairly significant extra cost. We got a more precise estimate in and around um, our furniture and equipment expectations and what we'd actually require. And all of that in the round came to about £1 million, pounds, um, plus, of course, the VAT. A couple of other aspects in this. Our optimism bias at the moment is, it is still set fairly high. We have it set at 20%. We talked to you before, we were at a lower percentage, um, but there's, there's a lot of uncertainty out there that members will be well aware of. And the, the final aspect which has influenced this significant move on budget, um, again, the experts are advising us that we need to make a, a significant allowance for the effects of uh, COVID and construction inflation in the current marketplace. And that, when you bring that into the mix, brings us up to the new figure of six million pounds, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, just a couple of points. Um, in seeking your budget, um, are you subject at all to any Department of Finance guidance, efficiency requirements, or is it just pitch it up for what you uh, what you think you need? Well, no, go and you can you can come in on sure. it. Um, we, there's been no request with regards to um, efficiency as we look into the three-year budget. Um, as we've reflected in the paper, there's been quite a bit of efficiency over the past sort of eight to ten years, and we took that quite early, I suppose, in the austerity period and built that in. So our budget is significantly reduced to what it was then, sort of by 40%. Um, we've used VES um, as the early efficiency uh, post 08, and that concluded uh, about 18, 24 months ago. So our budget build for the next three years is really based on what we feel we need to deliver um, the work to the Assembly, both from a statutory audit and a public reporting point of view. So there's been no requirement, unless you're going to remind me any differently, on efficiency uh, coming from Department of Finance. So as an organisation which isn't accountable to an independent board, which is really beyond scrutiny other than in respect of your estimates, even when it comes to your estimates, you don't live within the constraints of any Department of Finance guidance at all. I believe that we're being held to account by this committee and our, our budget is scrutinised by yourselves. Um, our budget is reviewed by PAC and I understand this committee takes on board the comments from PAC and Department of Finance 
on our budget. Um, so we are proposing our requirements for the next three years based on our business need. So how would the Department of Finance comment on your budget? Do you furnish it to them? Yeah. Um, through, through the chair, this, this committee furnishes it to DOF. Right, okay. And, we furnish and, it to them. So, and, then, and then you take comments from the Department? So, so I'm a bit surprised that as a body of the nature of GR, who's very good at scrutinising others, and necessarily so, that you yourselves are not subject to any guidance or restraints other than what's happening today, etc., in terms of your budget. Through the chair, I would just offer some thoughts. If I'd. Yep. Um, I suppose, I suppose that way back when, when we predicted we were in the, the time of austerity, uh, and departments were, were, were having to live within their existing budgets and having pay freezes um, and one percent pay increases. Um, as an organisation, we were exactly the same, and, and, and the CNAG was very clear back then. I've been around public audit for a wee while, so I can recall that time. Um, actually, he felt it was very important that we moved early, that we took our haircut early, um, um, and demonstrated that we were hopefully um, leading by example in terms of the budget that would apply to his office. To the extent that actually. We got to a stage during the absence of, of the Assembly um, that the CNAG needed to write to the Secretary of State because he felt that his budget was um, uh, uh, it was so restricted. Um, it got there at such a restricted stage that it was putting him under pressure to deliver a truly independent audit function. Um, so we're very, very mindful of efficiency, mindful of making our pitch right. Um, we, we, we're, that's the numbers that are in front of you. Um, hopefully, hopefully, we see them as very reasonable numbers to help us to get that staff base in the position we need it to be in. Um, the five percent probably looks like a fairly significant number, um, but you'll see it tailing off the impact of that into the two percent and the one point three percent in the years thereafter. Um, in relation to DOF, they will in, they will lay as closely with us. Um, but they understand as well that the primary function to review our budget is this committee. In terms of your new building, it, it was designed obviously before COVID and before the new norm of home working and all of that, which many people think things may not return to how they were. Have you revised your needs? in regard to that possible reality? Um, through the Chair, we, we, we looked at that very closely and continue to look at it nearly on a day-by-day -day basis throughout this design process. Um, it might sound a bit flippant to say it was almost as if we were future-proofing ourselves, but we were in the move to make better use of our space um, and, and rationalising the 60% of the, the property. Um, we're an audit function where we have our staff effectively in two places pre-COVID, um, in the office or out at clients, out at audited bodies. In, in the new world, our staff are in three places, um, be, it, be it the office, be it at home, be it out with audited bodies. I suppose none of us clearly knows what the future will be yet, but we, we actually see it as a hybrid. We're moving into a situation of having a working group to look very closely at the future of work, and we see it as a hybrid of that, that situation. So this new accommodation will enable us to provide a much more collaborative working environment for whenever we bring our staff into a much smaller space than what they occupied in the past. The, the furniture and desking and so forth that I touched on will provide great flexibility for that. We also want to become a more open environment. So our, our new ground floor will become an environment where we'll have a training facility, which we expect to be used much beyond NIAO. So we, need to, we want to throw our doors open to the wider public sector. Do you own your present building? We do. So is there an asset recovery? Or, uh, as you move forward with a new project, does that free up anything which will be sold? The, the, the intention is that we own the full building. The mm -hmm. intention is that what we will do is lease in the region of 40% of it. So we'll yeah. move into a new world where we'll be tenants, where, where, sorry, where we'll be landlords, mm -hmm. and we'll have tenants, and that will be the income stream. And that income stream is very important to underpin the business case for this overall project. Mm -hmm. okay. We've been operating that over the past year or so. Yeah. Um, the neurology inquiry occupies the ground floor of that part of the building that we're leasing out. 
and actually Nipso Dumbinsman, who will be coming in after us when they were decanting to refurb their building, they've been utilising that as well. Yeah. So we have, as Rodney said, with the exit of those numbers of staff, we have consolidated our staff into the front of the building and the wing down the side effectively can be a standalone um, part of the building that we can then um, lease out. Okay, I think, Chair, I will have further questions, I imagine, at a future occasion about the accountability and oversight, but I don't think today is the day for that. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, Joanne Bond. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, folks, for your, for your paper. Um, if I could just ask you a couple of queries with regard to staffing. Sure. Um, I know that you provided us the numbers and that you're intending to increase from 111 up to 125 full-time equivalents. Mm -hmm. um, I also note that you have said that that will cost around £170,000 a year. Sorry, I'm, I can't... I'm Sorry, I also you. note in, in, in your paper on page 6, paragraph 4, you have said that uh, approximately 70% of your costs are staff salaries. You've said on... Page five, paragraph seven. Yep. Maybe eighty-five percent of your budget is committed to staff costs yes. and expenditure. Yes. Um, and you've said that uh, consolidated inflationary increases and pay increments in the region of one hundred and seventy thousand are required each year. Yes. So, in light of that, um, and, and you've mentioned several times, Pamela, yep. um, the change in your staff to move from senior staff to junior staff, it would be helpful. I'm not asking you to provide it now, but okay. perhaps to furnish it, furnish us with it. Um, Perhaps you could give us some indication as to what your staffing levels and grades were sure. and what they have moved to sure. and uh, the savings found in that because if you have, if it's still 70% of your budget, um, mm -hmm. I'd be interested to know what percentage of your budget it was whenever you had all those senior people there. Um, the other question I have is with regard to best practice in audit. Mm -hmm. uh, and how the audit office ensures that it keeps uh, pace with changes in audit and with best practice. Okay. And my last point is with regard to your review of RHI implementations and you're bringing somebody on board to, uh, to address the, the implementation of that and to monitor that. But presumably that is not a lifetime appointment, presumably that is a temporary appointment because how long do you anticipate mm -hmm. that those are going to have to be monitored? So I'd be keen to understand the time frames with regard to that. Okay. Thank you. If I pick up on, and we'll certainly get you um, the staffing profile before and, and where we are now, I'm more than happy to do that. And actually, we've recently um, been submitting information into the Department of Finance, particularly around the voluntary exit scheme and, and the savings um, relating to that. So it'll, it'll all be cut up in the same aspect of it. Um, Best practice, um, it's two core aspects to our work. I mean, you will appreciate we also are involved in an aspect of fraud, uh, the National Fraud Initiative, but predominantly it's around financial audit and then the public reporting, the value for money side. So on the financial audit uh, side of our business, um, we currently operate um, using the National Audit Office audit methodology. So we call that our FAM, or financial audit methodology. That's one of the projects going forward that we're looking at. We're just mobilising the team uh, at the moment on that. Um, things have changed, um, um, both for us and indeed the NAO. The NAO would have uh, audits that require it to review under company, uh, under company law, which is not the case for ourselves. Um, so part of this project will just be to look at the appropriateness of that, still to us, along with looking at comparative audit methodologies with Audit Scotland and Audit Wales, uh, by way of example. We also recognise that, I mean, one of the uh, areas I've mentioned to you is around data analytics, and we are both continuing develop research and development in that and also moving forward with aspects of it at the same time. So we're mindful that we need to integrate that into any future audit methodology as we go forward. Um, we have a technical team that sits in the audit office, so in addition to the core staff that will be out doing audit, there's a technical team um, there to keep us up to date on those standards. So as FRC would re release further accounting standards and audit standards, uh, to engage through the NAO with our teams to make sure we're aware of that, how it impacts on our audit approach, and that staff are adequately trained and understand that. So there is a, um, a tight approach around that. Part of the staffing and uh, looking where we have got roles and expertise, we've enhanced that team, so we've put additional uh, capacity into that team, just re recognising changes over the past period of time. So that's on the, the best practice side. Um, on assuring ourselves that we're adhering to it and doing it properly. 
Um, that's where I've mentioned we have we would review our own work internally, just cold, cold review with our teams. We peer review, so colleagues from Audit Scotland, Audit Wales and the National Audit Office and ourselves participate um, in reviewing, cross-peering, reviewing each other's work. Um, and then in addition to that, on the financial audit side, as I say, we've recently gone to market and uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants England and Wales, ICAW, will come in and take a sample of our audits and review those against standards, give us that level of assurance as well. On the value for money side, um, we have an independent panel uh, to the organisation that will review the reports. Um, and we also peer review, again, with the same group of organisations uh, and experts in each of those audited bodies. Uh, we peer review that work as well. Thank you. Does that answer? So just on RHI then, is that okay on the best practice? Yes, is that where a couple of things. I'd be interested if, if you would, if you would, through the chairman, perhaps furnish us with, I suppose, action that you take to ensure that you are keeping pace, just so that we've got it. You know, there was a lot there, Pamela. Yeah. And um, the other thing is, with regard to peer review, do the, do the peers choose the cases they will look at, or do you furnish them with cases? Both. It's a mixture of both, actually. So some of it will be completely uh, random selection, uh, and some we will offer up. So that it's a mixture of both, particularly on the public reports. So if we've had something that's been quite high profile or whatever, uh, we will steer them towards it and say we think you should look at this, but um, it's a bit of both. And then the RHI appointment? RHI, I mentioned that sort of, I suppose, in my opening remarks, and you're quite right. Um, um, 44 recommendations. Um, we are working at the moment getting something onto the website, and we can furnish the committee also with it, which will outline the framework as to how we are going to approach this. So there's the recommendations themselves, um, and we're engaging at the moment um, just with the Department of Finance as a central conduit around progress in that, and when's the right time to actually get in and start to consider reporting on that. But in addition to that, uh, we're considering it as part of our forward work programme. So you will be familiar with our um, public reporting three-year programme. Uh, we obviously refreshed that this year in light of COVID-19. Um, and we're now in the process of that role, just looking as to what the next two to three years will look like. Um, and we will, we will look to studies that touch on issues uh, within those recommendations as well. So an example of that, um, Rodney was the director on, on capacity and capability. So that report will be finalised, be published soon and go to PAC. That was very much in the back of recommendations coming out of RHI. I suppose, Chairman, just all I'm, all I'm looking for really is how long do you envisage that post being required? How long do you envisage? Well, I'm not looking at it as a post, actually. I mean, I, I, it's not a case of putting one person in just to look at it. I think the fact we have a multifaceted approach to it, our approach was very much around enhancing the public reporting side yeah. and incorporating the RHI reporting into that. Okay. Yeah, John. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Emma, you've indicated you've got quite Alan? No, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I have, I have no further questions uh, either, but I do appreciate you both okay. being here today. Uh, and thank you very much for. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank thanks. You. Can I ask broadcast and using Starleaf and do spotlights, please? Uh, and I refer uh, members to the briefing paper from the uh, from NIPSO officials at 8.1, pages 177 to 186 of our members' packs. Checking if John McGinnity is on the spotlight. Can broadcasting bring him in? If yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, can I welcome our witnesses uh, and thank them for attending today, uh, representatives of NIPSO, 
uh, Margaret Kelly, newly uh, appointed uh, Ombudsman. You're very welcome. It's very uh, good to meet you again, Margaret. Uh, Paul McFadden, uh, Paul, you're welcome back to the committee, and John McGinnity um, on Starleaf, Director of Finance. Um, can I invite uh, witnesses to make a short uh, statement, if we can keep our, um, our opening remarks as, uh, as brief as possible. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Thank you, um, Mr Chairman and members, and thank you for the opportunity to meet you informally yesterday, which I find really helpful. Um, and I really welcome this opportunity to engage with the committee on my office and on our plans and budget proposals for the next three years. Um, I'm now in office just over six weeks. In fact, I think it may actually be seven weeks today because I started on a Wednesday. Um, and just we'd like to say that I've got a very good handle from the team in the office on where we are in terms of delivering to our strategic objectives, even in this very difficult climate. Um, and it may be that the committee want to follow up a little on the impact of COVID. Could I also just ask the committee to indulge me while I say a thank you um, to Paul McFadden, who did, as the committee will know, hold the role of acting ombudsman. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Paul for the really warm welcome that he's given me and also the very um, effective and efficient induction. So just really do want to put that on record with the committee. Um, the committee are aware that the previous annual budgets have caused some difficulty um, in planning. And so this move to a three-year budget really gives both you and me an opportunity to look strategically at these first three years of my appointment. Um, and we, even though it's been short notice in terms of turnaround for me, we really welcome this opportunity. So we will continue um, to prioritise delivering, delivering excellence in our maladministration complaints and investigations. Um, as the committee knows, there's been a really substantial increase. In fact, uh, they have more than doubled over the last four years in the complaints, um, but we are building on the work that we've already undertaken to be able to deliver efficiently and effectively on that. And I'm very committed to enabling us to continue to deliver within our current budget, and therefore members will note that we have built in only the necessary uplifts on that. And I would just take this opportunity to thank the committee, because I do know that earlier in the year the committee did give us some extra resource, um, and we are appreciative of that. We have, as an office, um, begun to develop our work on learning and improvement. And this is something on which I would really like to place further emphasis as a strategic priority going forward. Using the knowledge and the insight from complaints to enable public services to improve is an integral aspect of ombudsman's offices across the UK, many of whom have been delivering on this aspect of ombudsman's work for over a decade. There is, as I know members will know, a wealth of learning from complainants' experiences of our public services, and I believe they should be both captured and shared. And while my office had begun work on this, it was on an ad hoc basis, and it can't be achieved without some dedicated resource. And that's why I have included um, a proposed additional two members of staff to really proactively build this work over the next three years, to begin to really engage with public services on a regular basis, to begin to analyse our complaints and their chairs, uh, their trends, to be able to annually provide sectoral responses, which looks at complaints and areas for improvement. And I believe to share such analysis and reports with this committee and perhaps with other, other subject interest committees and to allow the work that comes from complaints to feed into policy development. Um, I'm very grateful to the committee for the support that they have given around the commencement of the Complaint Standards Authority and I appreciate your writing on our behalf. But again, this is a very good example for me of where my office has had this as a strategic focus, but it is now time to make that a reality. Um, Committee members raised yesterday with me that issue for their constituents of how complex the complaints landscape is, of how they often feel like they have to go to nine or ten different organisations or bodies before they get the redress they need, and how it's really difficult for many people to negotiate that. And I believe that if we introduce the CSA, that that really creates an opportunity to ensure a fairer, quicker and more straightforward complaints landscape. Um, it is a significant task, 
both in terms of complexity and scale. We envisage doing it on a sector by sector basis, but perhaps at a later date, I could return to committee and share our thoughts and plans around that. Um, I have drawn attention to those really particular areas of focus. Um, I am, of course, happy to discuss any of the areas within the paper and thank the committee for the opportunity to do so. Uh, thank you very much for your opening remarks and again to congratulate you on the appointment of your role and to wish you well in that role. Uh, I know from our uh, discussions yesterday that you're very much excited about the challenges ahead uh, uh, and uh, we look forward to engaging with you uh, throughout that process and also to put firmly on record our sincere thanks to Paul uh, for your work in, in, in the interim. Uh, until the appointment was made, and for your uh, assistance and coming before this committee over the course of the last uh, uh, year. Uh, we do appreciate it and we thank you for your efforts you. as well. Um, I'm going to open the floor first if any members have uh, questions. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Okay, um, do you want to understand better? The subdivision within the office when it comes to the local government investigations, I, I, I'm specifically referring to investigation of councillors, you have a significant budget for that. And just explain to the committee, as briefly as you could, uh, when a complaint is made, who investigates it and then who decides it? So I'm going to ask um, Paul to talk through that as that area of responsibility is separated out and so I'm going to sure. ask him to take you through that process. Yes, so the, the, the set within the office is there a separation between the investigative role and the adjudicative role. The Commissioner, Margaret, as, as always the Commissioner, is the adjudicator and is completely entirely separated from the receipt of complaints, the invest assessment of complaints, the investigation of those complaints, and only gets them when they are referred by myself as Deputy Commissioner to her for adjudication. So there's a, a small team within the office, the LGS Local Government Ethical Standards Directorate, who will undertake that assessment, investigation, and referral for adjudication, and all of the work that is in there between. That is done entirely without the Commissioner's knowledge and is done with full separation, so a Chinese wall within the office to make sure that, that there is no access to any of that to ensure the, the adequate separation of investigative and adjudicative activity. Uh, you said there's a Chinese wall, but when you stand back and look at it, and it has to pass the test of public credibility as well, when you stand back and look at it, the reality is that you, Mr McFadden, are the prosecutor uh -huh, uh -huh. and the ombudsman is the judge. That's right. That, that's, that's a good way of describing it. Now, does that strike you as a credible process? Well, it, it does strike me as a credible process. It's one that has worked and indeed um, it has stood the challenge of four High Court challenges yes, uh, right. on adjudications. You, you, you'll be aware, um, members of the committee may be aware, that there is a direct appeal route to the High Court on this yes. function. Yes. Um, of the, and I'm speaking off the top of my head, 14 or so adjudications to date, perhaps a little bit more than that, four of those have gone to, to the High Court. Um, councillors have taken their right to do that, and each of those have upheld well, the adjudication. So there has been scrutiny of Of that. all the cases that you have prosecuted, has the judge ever rejected your prosecution? On, well, there's, there's two points to make here. First of all, there are various other outcomes within the investigative process. So the, the, the processes are designed to ensure proportionality, reasonableness, um, and indeed to seek alternative action throughout that investigative process in the public interest, balancing the public interest and public confidence in the local government. And also, of course, good use of resources, because getting to the adjudicative stage is clearly quite expensive. Of the 7%, I think, or so, that have been referred by me to adjudication, um, all of those have been upheld by all the commissioner. So you and the have 100%? Yeah. On, on the prosecutor the within the one organisation has 100% success with the judge in the same organisation on the, the matter of breaches, so only the most egregious um, and those that I fight feel and the investigative side feel that there is the evidence of a breach 
would that be taken forward? So it's within my authority to determine whether there is insufficient evidence of a breach for referral. It's within my powers to, as Deputy Commissioner to decide that there is alternative action which can resolve this without proceeding through that process, which I think is entirely proportional. Just another point I want to draw out. When you deal with a councillor, you have the power to end their career. They can be banned from future service. That's correct. When you deal with a council, a complaint against a council for maladministration, you can barely slap their wrist. Isn't that right? Well, yes, it's an entirely separate uh, yeah, but legislative that's, that's the basis. Contrast. Yeah, of course. The council not. can see his career ended. The council <coughs> it's told, don't do that again. And they, they carry on. Of course, it is an entirely different statutory framework which has been established by this assembly. But that's uh, the reality. Legislative yeah. bidding that mm. it's on. But that's the reality. Like, what are your powers against a council that you find guilty of maladministration? I mean, they are the same at any other point. We yeah, will, or any other public like, body. Yeah, we will write to that public body. We will draw it to their attention. We will ask them to put in place some particular changes or recommendations, depending on that, what that might be. We can do consolatory payments, and we will continue to follow up yeah. with the public body. And I think that issue around both engagement and enforcement is one that in terms of those changes that public bodies may need to make, it, it is why I want that focus on um, engagement, impact and learning, because it is about actually going to those public bodies with a pattern or saying you need to make this, these changes yeah. or indeed engaging with members of this committee yeah. or other committees to say this is a significant issue. What, but they are two different legislative frameworks, yeah. you are right. And what's so the, the compensatory ceiling that you can order? It's not set out in that manner. Um, I think we, we have previously gone as far as, in, in under previous ombudsman, I should say, as far as 30,000. Yeah, I, I couldn't say specific, more. but yeah, I mean, there is the potential, and I'm referring to experience another ombudsman, to go where, you know, whatever the kind of case takes you in terms of direct loss that a complainant has suffered as a result of a public body's maladministration. Yeah. Um, but of course, that isn't the primary focus of the maladministrative side of the House. The primary focus is about um, redress, it is about restoring relationships, it is about holding public services to account. And you're involved in that side as well, Ms. Rickman? Yes, yeah, so as Deputy Ombudsman, I'm also Deputy Commissioner, mm -hmm. so obviously in Dep Deputy Ombudsman, I deputise to, to Margaret as Ombudsman on that so side. Uh, you say in your report that there are 1,043 complaints. That's right. Were all those accepted? For investigation. So they are all the complaints. So we have uh, different stages of a process in the Does that office. mean they've all been accepted? If they're a complaint, they have come through and we have looked at whether or not they can be accepted, whether or not they go to our initial investigation have, uh, Many of those have been accepted for investigation. And I just need to... Well, I, think, I think if I can maybe just expand on that part of the process. We have, like, like any other ombudsman or complaints have a body, we have processes to determine those complaints that, first of all, we can accept into the organisation under a statutory framework. Secondly, should those complaints we should, so taking into account factors such as proportionality, some of the factors I mentioned before, reasonableness and likelihood of achieving a suitable outcome. So those are kind of factors we'll take into account. Uh, and so w even within some of those, you will have, for example, settlements or early resolutions which are achieving some form of resolution or redress for individual complainants. Or there will be a decision not to investigate because there isn't sufficient well, evidence. Let me ask the question another way. So if 1,043, how many did you decide not to investigate? If you can just bear with me to get yeah, the I don't know statistics. I can find it in here either. I'm sorry, I think if you would bear with us, I come back in writing to you on that, if that's acceptable, Mr. Ulster. If you don't the answer, yeah. Well, I yeah. would that's not want to give you an answer that I couldn't absolutely stand over. And I would also 
like to make a difference between those complaints that we say they are not, they do not pass within our ability to um, investigate and those that we do a shorter investigation on and like settlement and resolution and those that we do a longer investigation on. I mean, I think I said to the committee yesterday that the how we describe that early part of our work which is often reaches settlement resolution. And I don't know if it helps if I give an example. So we had an example of someone given a round of IVF treatment. They had the possibility of two options on that, circled both. And unfortunately, when that was processed, only got one round. They brought it to us. And as part of the resolution, we got an agreement that they could have their second round. So there are things like that that are a complaint that we investigate and that we seek resolution. And there are others that go to a much longer investigation, which is why we have the different sets of KPIs. Well, I, think but I will break it down yeah. very clearly and forward it to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Strasser. Joanne, did you indicate there or no? I suppose, Chairman, if I might, very briefly. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just with regard to uh, the, the table on page two. Please, Margaret and Paul. Yeah. Um, I know that your year on year increase for one side of your organisation is 8.4%, mm -hmm. and your year on year increase on the other side of your investigation is 9.5%. Those are quite considerable increases, and I appreciate that you're taking on board two members of staff. My understanding is that that would be within the, uh, the complaints and standards side of the House, yeah. as it were. Um, but. 8.4 on the maladministration side is still a significant increase. Um, I've read some of the explanatory notes, but I would still be keen to hear from you as to I mean, why that those costs are significant in, in those particular years and then reducing again so in the I'm, subsequent years. If I, for me, the, the, this next initial year is putting in those additional staff, but I am going to ask um, John McGinnity, who is our finance person, to maybe explain that in slightly more detail. John, could I ask you to do that? Absolutely, uh, Margaret. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chair and members, just to, to say a little bit about the table, uh, the, the, the two sets of percentages are not discrete from each other. The 9.5% the at the, the bottom of the table refers to the overall budget for the organisation. So it's not purely uh, the local government ethical standards, as I think, uh, me Member Bunting, you, you were interpreting it as such. In, in actual fact, the table is showing that our, our baseline budget for the local government ethical standards function is remaining constant in monetary terms out over the projected budgetary period. And as uh, the Ombudsman was just alluding to, the, <clears throat> the reason for the rather steep looking increase in year one of the budget plan is purely down to the, the plans to, to initiate both the, the uh, with assemblies agreement, the complaint standards authority function, but also the, the two additional staff that uh, Margaret had mentioned earlier in relation to the learning and improvement team and, and the plans to, to focus a dedicated resource in that area. So those are the, the factors that give rise to the uh, relatively steep increase in year one. And then in the years beyond that, we're, we're looking purely at uh, projected cost of living increases. Thank you. Can I just follow up with one yeah. question, please, Chairman, if I may? Um, and within the table, part two, own initiative staff cost. Could you maybe just explain to us what own initiative is in these circumstances, please? Yeah, so own initiative is that power within the legislation that allows the Ombudsman um, to actually... To initiate an, to investigation. Initiate an investigation. Um, and I'm sorry, but if I could just for a minute. So, uh, so we did um, announce and begin an own initiative into PIP. And, um, and into the extent to which the use of further evidence in PIP claims or disalliance of PIP claims um, was effective. That is just beginning to draw to a close. We are at the point of sending, as we always do, draft chapters um, for factual accuracy to the department. And, and again, I would ask that maybe when that is complete, that the committee may be interested to actually see and understand a wee bit better the extent of that work. Um, I've described that as I've seen lots of PIP reports that 
present the perspective of the person claiming constituency office members who are dealing with PIP reports, advice services, but this actually goes in behind those PIP claimants and looks in behind the system of what is actually happening and how you end up with those decisions. Um, I think it will be of real interest and I want to make sure that that the Ombudsman's office is in a place to respond so where significant issues come up, where we feel that there is a systemic issue and we need that kind of own investigation. And again, to me, that's something that I'm sure members will have an interest in if we can undertake those. Chairman, just, I, I appreciate you answering those, Margaret. Um, I suppose uh, to finish, I would like to say 9.5% is not a small increase in terms of a budget. Um, I would be keen to understand, I, I appreciate um, your efforts or your intentions yeah. to to try and clarify the complaints procedures for society in Northern Ireland and therefore you'd anticipate on, uh, extra complaints. But I will be beyond the numbers of complaints. How will you, how will you know and how will we know, and how will the public know that a 9.5% increase in the budget is going to represent value for money? Well, I think there's a number of ways that you can know that. And, and I think if you look at, for example, and I know we've done some work on this in the past, if you look at what it costs when something ends up as a medical negligence claim as opposed to a complaint process, the cost of the public person that is hugely different. If you look at what it costs in terms of PIP appeals, around £14 million, I understand, where if actually we were getting that right, it should cost less. So I think there will be a bit that's about what you actually stop in terms of those additional costs. For me, there's a bit that's about what are the outcomes for citizens? So do citizens find it easier? Do you find in the people coming through your constituency office that they know where to go more easily? Do public services respond so they learn and improve more and we have less? of those huge inquiries. And that does not happen overnight. And it doesn't happen without some investment. And it doesn't happen without analysis. And to be honest, it also doesn't happen without your commitment and engagement. So I think all of those things are, for me, part of looking at the outcomes of the office and, and measuring some of the outcomes of change. But I can't do that if I don't have the staff to begin to put that in place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alan Chambers, you've... Indicated. Yeah, just, just a quick one, just to follow on there about Jim, when he, he was talking about uh, local councillors uh, and you having the power to either give them a short ban or uh, a, a expulsion from public life and parallel that with uh, what you can or can't do in relation to a council. Uh, so if in investigating a complaint against a local council you found that there was clearly quite bad, uh, quite unacceptable behaviour by, say, a senior official in that council, um, is your response uh, always just to the corporate body? Um, or do you have any powers to um, force someone uh, to take action against that uh, official who maybe was guilty of quite bad or unacceptable behaviour? I think the, the, the remit in relation to um, local councils or other public bodies in Northern Ireland is, is not focused on conduct, you know, as opposed to the, the, the ethical standards called the conduct regime, which is looking at elected members being held to a standard and account under a code of conduct specifically designed in a statutory framework. So. Our focus in, on those investigations is not on um, unacceptable conduct. It is about the actions of, as, as you've described it, perhaps the, the body corporate in terms of how that body corporate has administered itself within you know, the boundaries of legislation, policy, guidance and appropriate service. So there's an entirely different focus between these two different um, remits and functions, which, which it's hard to kind of draw those parallels. So, for, you know, for example, we are not assessing the conduct or practice of individual officers of the council. We are looking at the conduct of elected members of the council because that is what the code of conduct is there and established for us to do. Really 
That's the powers for which we have. Well, who holds uh, council officials in the account? What, uh, what overview body can intervene and say, look, this is... This well, that would be a matter on. for the council itself to, to assess um, and hold their own officials and staff to account for their conduct. Um, certainly as any other political employer. decision taken within the council then? So, sorry, well, Mr. A political decision taken or a, by the council. A, presumably a HR process within a council. Mm. So that would go, I would imagine, would go through the council's HR process if there were particular individuals or officials. So it's almost like an um, unemployment issue. And, and how Paul describes this is what we are empowered to do under the legislation. Do you have power to refer issues in the council's corporate body to the local government auditor? I'm looking at Paul because I don't know yeah. yet. Um, <laughs> sorry, can you repeat the first part of the question just yeah. to make sure I'm. If, if you discover that there's something amiss and awry within, in terms of how the council's operating as a corporate body, mm -hmm. do you have the power to refer that issue to the local government auditor? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we have the powers to refer, I think, specifically under. The, or explicitly under the 2016 Act, for the first time we have the power to, to refer mm -hmm. any matter to a, a whole range of bodies. Um, now that could cover a, a range of issues um, around probity, for example, if it's the Northern Ireland Audit Office. Um, it, it, yeah, we would also seek to share information where perhaps we see um, their remit or their strategic focus or plans or current work being more appropriate to catching issues. Um, to give a, maybe a, a kind of example of that in relation to PIP, there would be, you know, we, we were aware that the Northern Ireland Audit Office were undertaking one of their audits into the contract management of that PIP arrangement, whereas we were looking at, as Margaret described, the, the PIP from a slightly different angle, from a different angle in terms of injustice individuals and their experience. Uh, we would have regularly um, you know, um, engaged with the Audit Office and their team on that and passed information that we felt may be relevant to their contract for them to determine. So yes, that, that facility is there with the Audit Office and a whole range of other um, commissioners and other bodies I would, would hasten to add as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, members, time is against us. I have two points to make. Any of you? Any? One, thank you. Uh, paragraph 4.2 of the briefing paper uh, alludes to significant and far-reaching uh, uh, impact of the Ombudsman's findings and recommendations. Can you provide some further uh, information uh, of examples of this? For us, please, and, and just as briefly as you can. So again, that is within the own initiative. We can make recommendations around how systemic change should be addressed. So when I look at those individual complaints, they will often give me a picture, a metric in time, a picture, a snapshot. When I look at my own investigation, I am looking across a range of issues and so what we can propose in terms of recommendations for action is much more far-reaching because we're looking at it in a much more systemic way um, I, and I think when our PIP report is complete the members will be interested to okay. see some of that. Thank you. Uh, and just a, another brief question, has there been any update in relation to the comm commencement of the Complaints Standards Authority rule? We, other, we have not heard, um, we haven't yet heard back from the Assembly Commission yeah, on that, yeah. but uh, again, I am keen to see that commenced and put in place because I think we really need it. I think as citizens, we really need it. Is it possible for us to I would appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, can I Thank you. Can maybe add a point there? Yeah. Just on the budget point about CSA and, and the, the point about the 9.5% increase. The CSE powers, as, as you voted, were intended to be oh, commenced yeah, right. far earlier in the cycle of NIPSO before the suspension of the Assembly. So I think you know, we've always put into our budget plans that upon commencement, this ring fence money for the CSA powers would have landed probably earlier in the cycle. It just so happens with the yeah. re-establishment of the, the, the Assembly, they've landed in this year along with Margaret's um, wider yeah. learning improvement. Okay. So. Well, thank you both. Um, that, that's all we have for you. Is for now, but again, Margaret, best wishes to you, and thank you for uh, being before us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank you. very much.
course, uh, next item on our agenda is correspondence received uh, from the CNAG dated the 1st of October 2020 regarding the audit committee meeting of the 16th of September 2020. I refer uh, members to pages 188 uh, to 204 of uh, the members' packs. Uh, are uh, members happy to note correspondence? Or? Yeah. Noted. Okay. Sure, we'll have them in on the future stage, won't we? So. <laughs> Uh, can I refer members to 9.2, uh, pages 205 to 8 of members' packs, which relates to online training of questioning skills that uh, the Health Committee uh, availed of. Uh, can I seek members' views uh, on this uh, committee availing of the online training? Um, it could be included in the meeting of the 21st of October, if, uh, or an alternative, if, if agreed, instead of now. We'll go for an alternative date. 21st of October, okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Chair, are, we, are we bringing them in while I'm doing it electronically? And for if chair's content, I can circulate some stuff about that yep. after today's meeting. Okay. All agreed. Um, correspondence from the Northern Ireland Home's Office on an informal meeting with the recently appointed NIPSO Margaret Kelly. Noted. Uh, that's noted. Uh, refer members to page 209 of the members' packs. Can I ask members to note the correspondence? Uh, the informal meeting took place yesterday, as you know. Uh, correspondence from uh, Committee on Procedures regarding review of standing orders 110 to 115. Uh, can I refer members to 9.4 page 210 of our members' packs and ask members if they have any views uh, on the temporary standing orders which they wish to feed back to the Procedures Committee? Chairman, do you want to feed in your issue about being able to participate in debates remotely? Yes, that might be something that we could, but it's not really. We can certainly explore the, the option of that. Yeah. This is in reference to the particular emergency standing orders that were in place yeah. during the COVID. So, certainly. Yeah. Could, yeah. Bring something okay? back. Is I mean, that okay? It's where people in Similar future may have to isolate. It afford mm -hmm. them the opportunity to. Similar to the work. Westminster model, because the difficulty with the situation of the assembly at the minute is there are vulnerable members of the assembly that are forced to be here, but could be actually engaging remotely in a more safer environment. So I think it's worth exploring. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I refer members to? Uh, page 210 of the members' packs and ask members if they have any views on the tempering status. Oh, we've went through that, sorry, I'm covering the same thing. Refer members to 9.5, pages 211 of the members' pack and take members' views on schedule a briefing uh, at the next committee meeting on uh, the Northern Office, Audit Office annual report and accounts. I won't have time. Ha happy for a future meeting, yeah. Future meeting rather than the next one. Yeah, yeah. future meeting, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, beyond, of course, because the, yeah. the agenda seems to be mm -hmm. growing every day. Um, and uh, nine point six uh, correspondence from the committee on procedures regarding the budget setting methodology of the NIAC. Refer members to pages thirty eight to forty three of the members' table pack. I remind members um, that the committee had previously agreed to seek further information and advice on the best approach to codifying its role in regards to scrutinising and agreeing the budgets of the NIAC. Can I seek agreement? Uh, to commission some legal advice on the most appropriate vehicle to codify the committee's role in regards to scrutinising the NAAC budget. All agreed? Agreed. Okay. Um, can I seek agreement from the members of the committee uh, to update the procedures committee when this committee has concluded its deliberations on the matter? Okay. Uh, all agreed, yeah? Agreed. And uh, correspondence from uh, members of the public and refer members to an email received yesterday at page 44 of the table pack. All seen. Have you all seen that? <laughs> yeah. So we previously discussed the yep. holding reply for. Yeah. Oh yes. Okay. So we've agreed. Yeah, we have. So we'll yeah. Agreed to that. Okay. Okay. Um, and just as a point of clarity, because there was a bit of confusion at the start, we agreed the minutes uh, at, the, at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, it's just yeah. there's some confusion about your suggestions. It's just about the motion, but I suppose if we're yeah. going to produce a report, then we can yeah. have a motion after that. All agreed? Yeah, agreed. Yeah, agreed the minutes. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. clerk. Thank you. Um, any other business? No. Uh, the date and time of the next meeting uh, will be held on Wednesday, the 21st October, at 1 p at 12:15. Sorry, as agreed earlier in the committee. 12:15. 12:15. Yeah. 12:15. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll we said between 12:15 and 12:30, and um, we'll have to confirm what room. Hopefully, it'll be here or next door. Well, we'll, we'll keep that but between 12:15 and 12:30. Yeah. We can. Clarify. We'll clarify that. Of course, the next um, week. The other thing I would say is I, I haven't been in a board or committee yet where we've been allocated enough time yeah. to deal with the stuff. So be conscious as we're trying to progress these serious issues in the agenda that we are allocated because if, if we get through all the stuff in advance of time, great, but we're better at that than to rush yeah. matters of import, I think. 
Yeah, the, today was. There's quite a lot on that. And today, mm -hmm. at the 21st, will be the same. So yeah. we can arrange to meet more frequently as the agenda grows. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the meeting is adjourned. It's the end of the session. Thank you, members. Mm -hmm. Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland...